OK, let's talk about editing. So you have planned out your movie. You have shot all of the scenes. Now you need to think about how to put the scenes together. Editing is the first step in post production. Now, uh, some filmmakers, they don't have a clear idea of what they're what, what they want their movie to look like exactly like every shot, every angle. So when they shoot the movie, uh, sometimes they will shoot it from multiple different angles. Sometimes they will have actors try it this way, try it that way. And their idea is the more material I have to work with when I edit, the more likely it is that I can put together a good film. The danger of this kind of working is sometimes you'll realize that you're missing one shot or you're missing one scene or something in the middle of something needs to be fixed or adjusted. Uh, in this case, the filmmaker can either uh, forget it and use the second best option and hope the audience doesn't notice. Or they might call the uh, relevant actors back and they will do what's called reshoots or pickup shots, uh, which is extra shooting in order to fill in the holes that are discovered while editing. Uh, but in this case, sometimes they can't find the actors. The actors are busy. They're doing something else. Maybe they don't have the money. Maybe they don't, they don't have the time. Uh, so a lot of the time, what an editor's job is, uh, is actually to cover up mistakes or cover up things that don't make sense uh, in the imagery that they already have on hand. So like, for example, if you watch uh, action movies and like, you know, action movies, when they're good, they're very good, but when they're bad, they are very bad. And a bad action movie, uh, sometimes you will hear people say, uh, the editing was terrible, right? It was too fast. The, the shots don't make sense. It doesn't fit together. But sometimes that's the case because the shots that would make sense are terrible shots. Maybe the lighting is off. Maybe the actor did a terrible job that time. So the editor doesn't have a choice. They can only use uh, either a bad shot or they put the scene together in a way that doesn't make sense. But a good filmmaker, when they begin making the movie, will have a clear idea of what they want the movie to look like. Uh, sometimes they will even draw out each scene on the page to make what's called a storyboard. Uh, so that when they actually shoot the movie, they know what each shot is supposed to look like. They know the angle, they know the sequence. And the actors are also clear about uh, what's going on in this scene? How does it fit into the general story? In that case, editing can be uh, actually quite fast. Uh, and so if it's this kind of good situation, then the editor only needs to focus on, for example, how long should each scene be? How fast should uh, the, the film switch to a different shot? Uh, today, most Hollywood movies, the length of each shot is around two seconds. That's already considered uh, a little bit long. Uh, if you think about your average Hollywood movie, how long does the camera stay still before switching to another image? Around two seconds. Sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, but the average is around two seconds. So uh, if the editor um, continues with the same shot for longer than that, it slows the movie down. If they switch to another image faster, it speeds the movie up. Um, and so depending on what the director wants, whether they want to make a fast and exciting movie or a slow and contemplative meditative movie, uh, that idea of pacing is something that is controlled by the editor. Uh, so when you shoot the movie, um, the, you, the classic sequence is lights, camera, action. So you'll notice that the camera is not the last thing to begin. 
it's the actors that begin the last. Uh, and this means that when you actually shoot the movie and you create the footage, you will have to cut off the beginning and the end of each shot. So the question then becomes, how much off the beginning? How much off the end should you cut? Uh, well, obviously you, you need to cut somewhere where the actors have already started acting. You don't want to include footage before the actors begin or after the actors have finished the scene. So when you shoot a movie, uh, we saw in Day for Night, they have a clapboard, right? Paiban. What is that for? On the clapboard, you have key information. The name of the movie, which scene are they doing, and which take, which means how many times have they shot this part. Um, this is to help the editor know, okay, this sequence is uh, fits into this place in the movie, and this is the third time, this is the fourth time. It helps to uh, prevent the editor from mixing together uh, footage from different takes. It helps to organize the original footage. And then when they begin, they clap the board, right? That is to help synchronize sound. We know that in a movie, the sound does not have to match the image. Sometimes uh, you will have someone who is not on screen who is talking. You might have sounds from a flashback. The sound doesn't have to fit the image. So uh, when the sound does fit the image, the editor has to match the image and sound exactly. That's why they have a clapboard. It's the exact moment when that sound comes from that image. So they align the sound and the image according to that moment, and then they can begin choosing which parts to take and which parts to leave out. So that brings us to the sound editing also. Now, usually the sound editor and the image editor are different people. Uh, but the logic is very similar. Do you want the sound to match with the image? If there's nothing special going on, then yes. Uh, but in certain situations, you want the sound to be different from the image. For example, two people are having a conversation. Uh, we would usually think, OK, so we look at the person talking. And then when the next person starts talking, we switch over and we look at the next person. But that's not, not always true. Good editing, uh, small scale micro editing. Uh, good editing should be intuitive. Imagine you are the camera. You are a person looking at these two people. When would you want to turn your head? and focus on the next person. The camera and the editing should follow that idea. In a conversation, uh, you may not always be paying attention to what is happening in the moment. Maybe you're talking to somebody and they just said something that is surprising and you need time to understand what uh, they just said. Or maybe uh, you're, you're kind of getting bored because you know how uh, this person is going to finish their sentence. So your attention in a conversation may switch faster than or slower than the alternation of people talking. So good editing will follow that rhythm. So sometimes you will watch a movie and there's two people talking, uh, but the camera will sometimes focus on the person who is listening. And that's why, because uh, in that moment, the person who is talking is not as important as the person who is listening. Maybe the person who is talking, what they're saying is predictable or it's irrelevant, um, or maybe the point of the person saying those things is the effect it would have on the listener. So in these small situations also, editing follows attention. Uh, this is known as subjective editing. Uh, this also is important for action sequences. If you like you have a, a fight scene, how do you want to uh, arrange the shots of the entire scene and smaller shots of like an individual punch or an individual flip? How do you move from the 
general to the specific to the general to the specific. And the answer, of course, again, is following intuition. Which part of this sequence is the most interesting? Which part is uh, the part that the audience would probably want to focus on? Those parts, uh, you need to give a close up, bigger shot, a closer shot of those details. So a good example here is the Born Identity, the one starring Matt Damon. Uh, the director, Paul Greengrass, is very good at uh, focusing on the details of a fight. So if you watch uh, Matt Damon fight in that movie, like the camera will begin with a shot of the two people fighting, but in the middle of the fight, every single shot is following the key part. If Matt Damon throws a punch, the camera is following his hand. If his enemy like kicks him back, the camera is following the enemy's foot. It's all very carefully and specifically edited uh, so that uh, it may look fast, it may look exciting, but you are always sure of what is going on. You're never confused. This is something that me, uh, I would say most action movies fail to do. Uh, most people learn the wrong lesson from that kind of editing. Most people think, oh, if you want to make it exciting, shake the camera around. My God, no. Just shaking the camera for no reason just uh, gives people a headache. Uh, be because people saw uh, that movie's fast editing, but they didn't notice that each shot, each cut from image to image had a purpose. Um, yeah, so that's micro editing. Uh, following intuition. Then you have uh, macro editing, larger scale editing. How do you get from one scene to the next scene? Uh, when does this scene end? Or when should this scene end? And when should the next scene begin? Uh, sometimes you will see movies that as soon as the actor says the last line, immediately the image shifts to the next scene. Uh, if this is a good choice, then it's usually because the last line is not very important. But if the last line is important and the audience and like the other characters need some time to digest or comprehend this last line, it makes more sense to stay with this scene for like a uh, one second or half a second longer and then switch to the next scene. A uh, similar idea when you get to the next scene, you have to let the audience settle into the scene. You can't just um, let the scene begin and then start throwing information at the audience. You have to let them get used to the fact that we are now in a new scene. So often new scenes will begin with a wide shot or an exterior shot. Uh, this is called an establishing shot. It establishes where we are, the location, the setting, time and place. And then you have a medium shot of like who is in this scene, everybody in the same picture. And then when the actors begin acting, then you can go closer and focus on individual people. You want to uh, ease the audience into the new situation. That's the image. Uh, sound editing, macro editing follows a similar logic. Have you ever seen a movie and like at the start of a new scene, there is like a thump or a, a loud sound and it scares you, but it's not supposed to be a scary scene. That's bad sound editing. The, the audience is not ready for that sound. So uh, the audience is easily scared, but you don't want them to be scared. So that's not what you were trying to do. Sometimes you do want to scare the audience and that's good, uh, but if you, if the next scene begins with a loud noise, uh, you need to use sound also to ease the audience in. For example, uh, sometimes when you watch a Hollywood movie, uh, the, the first scene is the character says, we need to go somewhere, uh, take a plane to go somewhere. So the next scene shows you an airplane or like they're at the airport or like the plane is flying through the sky. Airplanes are loud. So if you move from a quiet conversation and then suddenly, boom, airplane sounds, it could scare the audience. So often what a movie will do is they will, the image, you can't really like 
uh, slowly shift the image, right? The image goes from conversation to airplane. But you can slowly shift the sound. You can, after the conversation ends, this scene is silent, but you can slowly add in the airplane sound from quiet to loud. It's like you're, sli you're slightly turning up the volume on the airplane. Uh, some people would do this after they change to the new image. Sometimes people would do this before they change to the new image. So uh, the second case, if you want to change the sound before the image, th these two characters have a conversation and you kind of un already understand that they need to take a trip. So when the actor says the last line, we need to take a trip, already while the actor is talking, you can already add in the airplane sound. And when the airplane sound is almost uh, as loud as it needs to be, then you switch the image. The audience is already prepared. They won't get scared. Uh, or you can do the reverse, right? We need to take a trip. Switch image and then you gradually add in the airplane sound. Also works. Uh, but the idea is to always keep your audience in mind when you edit. This is a challenge for many professional filmmakers because by the time you get into the editing room and you start putting together your movie, you have already seen each piece of footage multiple times. When you were shooting it the first time, when you are choosing which take to use, which is better, which is worse. And then finally in the editing room, when you're deciding when to switch from this scene to the next scene, when to switch from this shot to the next shot, you're already too familiar with the footage. So it can become hard to uh, predict how the audience might react for the first time. Uh, because when you're when you're looking at your own film, you already know what's coming next, but the audience doesn't know. Uh, this is why sometimes films will accidentally scare the audience because the filmmakers know what's coming, but the audience doesn't. And so the filmmakers are prepared, even though they forget to prepare the audience for a sudden change or a sudden switch. Um, now, I keep talking about the editor because the editor is the person who actually cuts the footage and puts them together on a specific point or for a specific scene. But of course, it is the director who decides, uh, like, should the editing be fast or slow? What order of the scenes should we use? Should we use this shot or the next shot? Um, so oftentimes it's hard to divide credit between the director and the editor, especially today when everything is digital. Back in the old days, the editor actually had to have a machine and had to take the negative uh, D pin and had to string it on the machine. So when we say a cut, it used to literally mean the editor would take a pair of scissors and cut through the film at the point uh, where he wants to stop the selection. Today, of course, it's all digital. If you delete something, you can get it back. Uh, if you don't like an idea, you can change it up. Um, but at the same time, it also means that you don't always need the technical proficiency with the editing machine. Everybody knows how to use a mouse and a keyboard. Uh, so more and more today, you will see directors who edit their own movies or uh, they will control the editing software with the advice of an editor. Sometimes you will also see like um, important actors helping with the edit, uh, especially like if the director or the editor wants to know uh, what were you feeling in this scene? Does it fit what you were feeling in the next scene? They might ask the actor to come in. The one person that uh, is not usually like you you might think this person would be asked to help with editing but usually not this person is the writer might be kind of surprising because they wrote the movie they wrote the screenplay uh, but directors uh, 
often will not ask the writer to join in the editing. And this is because the script gets changed day by day when you're making a movie. Uh, on the set or on the location, thing there will be surprises, there will be accidents. Uh, maybe the actors will feel like this is not the right way to do this scene. So there will be changes on the script throughout the shooting process. So by the time you get to the editing room, the writer may not be familiar with the movie that is being made. They may only know the movie that they wrote. So this is a difference from like when we watched Day for Night, uh, the woman, Natalie, the woman who had sex by the river, she's actually the writer. And so in that French movie, you saw her uh, joining in the entire process of filmmaking. This is very unusual in American films. In American films, usually the writer writes a script, they sell it to a company or a director, and that's it. Uh, they, they make money by selling their writing, not by making their writing. Uh, okay, so that's editing. I think I covered all that I wanted to say. Do you have questions? Okay, today we're watching a, a type of movie that, like the, I call this type of movie a subgenre movie or a subculture movie. Uh, but there, this is not actually an official term, subculture movie. I, I'm combining many different kinds of types. So sometimes, like you will have gay movies, you will have black uh, black movies, which are called black exploitation. Uh, you'll have like uh, movies about different kinds of people in society. What, uh, what unifies these different kinds of movies, the reason I can put them all together is that this kind of movie focuses on a part of society that not everybody is familiar with or not everybody has the chance to become familiar with. Now, in a sense, uh, every movie has its own world. Every story has its own world. And so uh, each story has some specific parts that are unfamiliar to us uh, unless we made the film, right? Every person's idea of life is different. Every person's experience of life is different. What a subculture film does is uh, it brings out a part of culture or a part of society that is not just different in the details, but also different in the way that the characters understand life and life experience. So like a, a gay movie uh, featuring characters who are gay will often deal with experiences that uh, straight people may not have even heard of or have, may not have thought of. Or today in this case, a movie about uh, black people playing basketball, they have to deal with things that I'm pretty sure most of you uh, have not thought of before, related to the fact that they are black in the, in the United States and related to the fact that they are playing basketball, which is a sport in the US that is dominated by black people, even though management is mostly white people. Um, so when we watch a movie about a subculture, the thing to keep in mind or to the thing to ask ourselves is, is this movie made for the people in that subculture? Or is it made for people outside of that subculture? In other words, is it trying to explain the subculture to everybody else? Or is it bringing out an authentic experience of somebody within this subculture. Uh, this is commonly known as, it, is the movie for us? Is the movie for you? Who is the targeted audience of this film? Like Just like when we write an essay, you want to have in mind your reader. Does your reader understand the background of this situation? How much do you need to explain to the reader? Same with movies. 
does your audience already understand this world? How much do you have to explain to your audience? Uh, like if you make a movie about like uh, a group of kids who love playing with computers and electronics and things like that, and there's lots of technical information, then you may have to explain a bit more. But if you make a movie about college students for this class, you don't need to explain much because, well, you're all college students. So uh, presumably you all share most of the same college experiences. So again, uh, what kind of people are you making the movie for? How much do you have to explain? The more you explain, the less natural the movie will feel. Uh, because like, if you think about it, a movie, the story of a movie is a group of people who already exist in that world going about their life. They don't need to explain to each other what's going on because they already live in that world. So if you have to pause and explain something to the audience, maybe you write some dialogue for the characters uh, that shed light on what kind of world this is. The more explanation you do, the less realistic it becomes. It becomes more and more obvious that you are explaining things to the audience instead of telling a story about the people. So like every movie needs exposition. Every movie needs to explain things. The key here becomes how do you work out a situation where the actors have to or the characters have to talk about this thing that they already understand? And then how much can you trust the audience to figure out on their own and you don't have to explain every single thing? You have to try to find to uh, find a balance between explaining nothing and explaining everything. Uh, again, depending on your subject matter and your audience. So today the movie we're watching is called High Flying Bird, directed by Steven Soderbergh. Soderbergh is most famous for Ocean's Eleven, Man Tian Guo Hai. Uh, so you know that this is the director who has a clear idea of what kind of movie he wants to make. And he his movies are often fast. They move quickly from scene to scene, from point to point. But also Soderbergh in recent years has been speeding up how he makes movies also. Like in the past, you might need six months to a year, maybe two years to make a movie. Now Soderbergh uses three months to make a movie. He's moving faster and faster. And the reason he's so fast is because he's using the latest technology. Uh, so like when you think about technology uh, in filmmaking, you might think of like, oh, big special effects or like uh, big uh, loud fight sequences or something like that, explosions. Soderbergh uses technology that helps him make films easier. The PDF I provided for this week is a discussion about how he used an iPhone to make this movie and how much time it saved him. Another thing that he does to speed up filmmaking is because he knows uh, exactly how he wants his movie to look, after finishing work during the day, he takes that footage and he edits it on his way home so that by the time he gets home, he's basically finished editing that day's footage. So he doesn't have to spend another six months in the editing room because he edits while he shoots. Uh, traditionally, it, this has been impossible before digital. Um, but even before digital, you had directors who did what we call edit in your head, which means when they're shooting the movie, they can tell, oh, this is a bad shot, this is a bad sequence, or they can tell, oh, this would fit in that part of the film, this would fit in that part of the film. And so like, they already have an idea of exactly how they want to put it all together. So when they get into the editing room, it's much faster. Instead of like figuring out uh, which piece of the puzzle goes where, it's like they catalog all of the pieces. And when they get into the editing room, they just follow their uh, predetermined instructions to fit things together. Uh, but with digital technology today, you can literally edit uh, while you shoot, which is uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, 
to see how fast Soderbergh can make a movie. So High Flying Bird is uh, notable for being the first time he used an iPhone and one of the first times he did this like on the go editing. This is after his, uh, I think, first or second retirement. Like Soderbergh is, uh, I don't know, man. Like he, he declared that he would retire from filmmaking. Then he came back. Then he said, I'm, I'm really going to retire this time. Then he came back and he made High Flying Bird and he keeps on making movies. So he's not retiring anytime soon. Uh, but the idea is that something about this project drew him back from retirement. Something about the story, something about the way he made this film interested him. Uh, and it's probably to do with the use of the latest technology. Now, Soderbergh makes movies that are fast, uh, including the dialogue, including the editing. So within a scene, he, he moves fast, and from scene to scene, he also moves fast. Uh, so this movie is around 93 minutes long, uh, but it will feel like it gives you much more information than should fit in a 90-minute movie. Uh, in other words, uh, you might want to pay close attention to what's going on. Um, okay, questions about uh, like subculture films and this film? Editing is an art. It's a very subjective art. Uh, so there's not too much I can say to explain everything very clearly. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break, come back at 12.30. Yeah, yeah, please come back at 12.30, 1.30. Yeah, come back at 1.30 and we'll watch the movie. OK, uh, that was the movie. Uh, in case you are not entirely sure what happened, uh, the idea is that Ray uh, used the antagonism between the two players to give the impression that they would be starting another series of games and that the NBA uh, owners would not be able to make money from those games. That gave pressure to the team owners to negotiate with the television networks faster. And once they finished those negotiations, then the team owners would come back to negotiate with the players. Uh, so the the point of the story is that uh, the there are, there are two levels, right? That was the higher level negotiations. But if you look at it that way, Ray was using Eric, right? Eric was already uh, undisciplined on Twitter, al is already creating uh, this situation online. And Ray, instead of doing what's best for Eric, used the situation to solve the bigger problem. Uh, so on the one hand, it's a story about a negotiation. On the other hand, it's a story about Eric opening his eyes to what it means to say that the NBA is not just basketball, it's a business. Uh, and so the book that uh, they're reading at the end, The Revolt of the Black Athlete, is a book about this idea, about how uh, especially uh, black athletes in the US are treated as a way to make money and are not necessarily treated uh, as well as they should be. So when Ray said at the beginning, uh, you'll know when it's time to look at this book, uh, he knew at that moment that Eric was not aware of this, what they call the game above the game. He had to go through this entire situation, uh, realize that Ray was using him and fire Ray because that is what's best for himself. And uh, only then is he ready to face the idea that uh, what it means for basketball to be a business and for himself to be the commodity, something. Uh, now, the way that the movie is told 
is basically all dialogue, right? It's one of the, it's what I call a meeting movie. Every scene is a meeting. So the key here question is, how do you make a series of conversations interesting? Uh, oh, of course, first of all, the conversations themselves are pretty interesting. And uh, that's because the key information is not immediately given to us. Most of these conversations are negotiations, especially at the beginning. If you remember the scene with the two women in the car at the end, Myra says, thank you for giving me information about the, the competitors. It's a negotiation. So if in a conversation, neither person is going to give the key information. That means that we as the audience also have to pay attention in order to find the key information. So it takes a bit of brain power to understand what's going on. But the other way that the movie makes these conversations interesting is by using the camera. You'll notice each conversation begins with a shot of two people. And then as the situation develops, uh, you get a close up shot of each individual person. And then when the conversation uh, switches, right, when the key moment comes, the camera often changes to a different angle. Uh, sometimes it's the exact opposite angle. So at, from uh, when we begin the conversation, we're looking at it from this way. But once the key moment comes, we turn around and look at it from that way. Uh, and that signals that something important has changed in the conversation, that there is key information being revealed. Uh, so tying it back to today's unit, you have all of these shots of people talking. How do you put them together? That's the question of editing. Uh, and really what uh, Soderbergh does is he chooses very interesting angles. So many shots of people talking are not like straightforward middle shots. You have odd angles, you have wide angles. Um, and so by alternating between these different angles, uh, we not only are continuing to be interested in what's being shown on screen, uh, we're also being told through the language of the camera and the language of editing, we're being told how the conversation is shifting uh, and like what stage of the conversation we have reached. Uh, and you also notice that the dialogue is very fast. It's also very black. There's lots of so-called African-American vernacular English. Uh, in, I guess in Chinese, this is something like there's a hair in England. And that kind of uh, language moves very fast. Uh, the negotiations move very fast. And like each scene is also uh, there to give us information. And then we move on to the next scene. All of that is because the editing is very, we call this very tight, very close. There's not too much wasted imagery. There's not a lot of wasted time. Uh, about the only sequence where the point is not information is the opening. Uh, what would we would usually think of as the opening titles when Ray is walking across the city because he doesn't have money for a taxi. In a traditional movie, that would be when the movie would show us the title of the movie, the actors and the key people. Uh, but in this movie, Soderbergh decided to keep all of that information for the end. Instead, that opening sequence gives us a view of the city and it gives us a sense of location. A sense of location becomes important when we get to Spencer's basketball court and the talk about charity and community because community is based in location. So by following Ray across the city, uh, the film is putting us in his community. We're not looking at this from the outside. We're in the negotiations with Ray. We're on Ray's side. So this subculture film, it is about a subculture that I'm sure few of us uh, would think about uh, in our daily lives, right? Uh, black players in the NBA having to deal with uh, a culture where white people are in control. But 
we all understand the idea of a sense of community. And so when we're placed with Ray on the same side, we're more open to trying to learn about what's going on. It's not just studying a community. It's like we're being put in this community and we're trying to figure out uh, like how people feel and what uh, what people want to achieve, uh, just like Ray is doing in order to find his way through uh, this negotiation. So like editing is a key part of this movie in like keeping things moving fast, uh, preventing us from getting bored by all of the conversation. There's also uh, one very early shot that I love so much. This uh, it's an edit. It's a cut. If you remember at the end of the first restaurant conversation, right? Ray and Eric stand up and they leave. The camera goes up. And then we cut to the outdoor sky and then the camera comes back down. Uh, we mentioned an idea when we were when we were watching Twilight called the match cut. The idea is when you shift one from one scene to the next scene, you use images from these two scenes that are very similar. In Twilight, it was uh, the first scene was Edward is jumping down from a cliff and the second scene is he lands on the pickup truck. So both scenes are put together using a jump, a character jumps. But in that match cut, the similarity between uh, the end of the restaurant scene and the beginning of the outdoor scene is simply the sky. In other words, this is a kind of match cut that uh, Soderbergh could have used anywhere. It's not dependent on what's happening in the scene. Every scene you can point the camera upwards. Uh, I just thought that was that was fantastic. Um, it's a it's a casual one young genius. Uh, now speaking of editing, however, this movie also has uh, interviews with previous uh, rookie of the year. Uh, first pick basketball players from real life. Those were not characters. Those are real basketball players. And the idea there for the general idea is to give us a, another aspect of this world. Most of us do not have not played in the NBA. So hearing from these actual players talk about what it's like their first year uh, puts us on the side of Eric so that we kind of understand what he's going through as well. But in terms of filmmaking, uh, these interview sequences are also very interesting because they often help to bridge the gap between two scenes that are far apart. And they do this uh, by giving us information that seems connected to one side or the other side. These interview sequences bridge different scenes. Uh, by giving information and also by um, like giving us a bit of breathing space between scenes that could be very different or very far apart. Um, in a traditional movie, sometimes you would uh, achieve this effect by giving a black screen, a slight pause instead of cutting directly from one scene to the next. But here Soderbergh uses that chance to give us more information to help us understand this subculture. Yeah, OK, so do you have questions about this film? OK, next week we're watching a science fiction movie called Ad Astra, uh, directed by James Gray, starring Brad Pitt and Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, and the filmmaking focus will be on the use of sound, music, sound effects, voiceovers, paying. Uh, yeah, so uh, next week I'll talk about sound and then I'll talk about science fiction and then we'll watch the movie. Um, OK, I want to make sure. Is anyone here in the middle of writing a movie project, a final project? Okay, 
uh, I'll divide you guys into groups next week so that you have a bit more time to work on the final project. Okay, see you next week.